All right, what's up, everybody? Let's kick it off. It's a little past 9 p.m. on Tuesday. You know what that means. Live stream time, going through the Rust book, starting with chapter eight today. We got through chapter six and seven last week. Thank you for joining the stream. I'm Tom McGurl. If you're not joining the stream live and you're on YouTube, thank you for, for joining and watching on YouTube. I appreciate it. I got my Twitter handle down there low so you can catch it. Catch when I go live, you get updates. So give a follow over there and you'll, you'll get some updates when I go live. Uh, what else we got? We got the YouTube channel. If you missed any of the previous series, do not fret. All the chapters so far, one through seven, are posted on YouTube. You can watch them at 1.69 speed, as Clan Watson over in the chat said he did. You can watch them at 1.7, which I think is a real speed. 1.5, whatever you want. Breeze through them. You can watch them on regular speed, you know? You like the, uh, the subtle tones of my voice, then regular speed is probably best for you. Um, but yeah, so today we're going to be doing chapter eight. As a recap, what we've been doing is going through the Rust programming language book. Uh, we always have to give a shout out to our authors, Steve Kolobnik, Carol Nichols, and any of the people from the Rust community who have contributed to this book. Thank you. We could not be here without you doing this. It's helping me learn Rust. I hope it's helping all of you learn Rust. I've had a great time with it, and it's such a great resource for a language to have. Um, just fantastic job. If you don't know how to get to this, um, all you need to do is go to the Rust website, rustlang.org, hit that learn button in the top corner, read the book. So they, they, we call it the book, which is pretty cool. There's also other books uh, available to Rust, but from what I've heard, this is the place to start, and that's why we started here. Again, here's the Twitter. Give me a follow if you want to get notified when I go live. And we got the repo. This is where we're putting all the code. All the code we've been writing as part of this learning experience gets pushed up to this repo. Um, you can find it on my GitHub, Tom McGurl. And the repo name is Learn Rust Live. I'll paste it here in the chat. Or get your own repo going. You know, follow along. You want to start your own repo to for your learning experience. Code, code up what you want. Maybe try some exercises. Uh, do that. That's pretty cool. All right. So. Let's do a little quick recap and then we'll get into where we're at with chapter eight. So last time we went over chapter seven and chapter six, we started with six, uh, is where we learned about enums and pattern matching. So I created a little project here when we were going through enums, so I'll pull that up. And we used the IP address enum as an example. So an IP address that could be of type V4 or V6 V4 being represented by four unsigned 8-bit integers and V6 being represented by a string. Uh, so that was our first experience with enums. And then we got a little bit more into it by doing some stuff with pattern matching, uh, where we learned about the different arms of a pattern matching expression. And we saw some early on when we did our guessing game, which would be in the first video of our series, uh, where we did code up this guessing game. And you can see, here I was messing around, but here you can see a, a match expression. And then we also have a match expression here <clears throat> where you're matching on the different cases of an option. Uh, we also created one here. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, I believe it was called coins. Yes, so we created a coin enum uh, with a penny, nickel, dime, and quarter. And our quarter was a state quarter. And what we did with that is we allowed um, basically to match on the different coins. And we checked the coin. If it's a penny, we printed lucky penny and one. If it's a state quarter, we pulled the state out and printed that as well. So it showed us how match statements can be flexible and actually get information from their uh, corresponding enum that we're matching over. So that was chapter seven. Um, chapter eight, we dug into modules and managing a project that gets a little bit larger. And so I created, we had this restaurant repo here where we had a libRS because we were built a library binary. Um, a library crate actually was the word that they used. And we had this um, module called front of house and we had some functionality. And it was a metaphor for, um, you know, you think about a restaurant, right? You have the front of house, which is the servers, the staff in front, the hostesses, um, anyone working the front, you know, bus people. And then you have in the back, you have the chefs, sous chef, line cooks, um, anyone expoing the items, maybe you have someone in the office managing the restaurant. So we had our front of house and we broke out front of house into its own module and 
worked a little bit with the module system. So we saw how we were able to call different functions when we had to make functions public. We talked about relative pathing, absolute pathing. So just general stuff to get a project going and something we'll probably dig into more as we build, actually, you know, build something bigger with Rust. But today it's all about chapter eight, common collections. So this is, we're going to kick it off. Uh, we're going to learn about vectors, strings, hash maps. So if you're familiar with collections in other languages, we'll try to relate them. We'll try to relate them to the stuff we know in, in JavaScript or Python. Um, but yeah, so let's go without further ado. Chapter eight, let's dive in. So common collections, right? So Rust standard library includes a number of very useful data structures called collections. Most other data types represent one specific value, but collections can contain multiple values. Unlike the built-in array or tuple types, the data these collections point to is stored on the heap. So we talked about the stack versus the heap. And we talked about how an array, if we specify its length ahead of time, we declare it, it's stored on the stack because we know exactly how much memory we need allocated for it. So the stack is great. Um, we also talked about that with tuples. Tuples have a fixed size, right? They, you know, you can do a two, a three. Um, and so those are gonna be allocated on the stack. Now we're dealing with collections that are stored on the heap. Um, which means that the amount of data does not need to be known at compile time and can grow or shrink as the program runs. So this is like, if you've ever worked with a language where you had to declare the size of an array in advance, um, you could think of that as declaring an array on the stack, right? Um, if you think of a language like JavaScript or Python where we can keep pushing onto arrays as the program goes on, that's, that's gonna allow us to do modifications to it at runtime. So that's what we're talking about, the difference between having to declare it up front and not being able to change it versus um, not having to declare about the size and letting your array grow and shrink as it needs to while the application is running. Uh, each kind of collection has different capabilities and costs, and choosing an appropriate one for your current situation is a skill you'll develop over time. In this chapter, we'll discuss three collections that are used very often in Rust programs. We're always going to be talking about the trade-offs of cost, right? We get flexibility, which is going to cost us a little more. And when we're dealing with a low-level systems programming language, uh, we want to use memory efficiently and we want things to be fast, and that's why we point out these these trade-offs between cost and flexibility. So a vector, that's the first one, it allows you to store a variable number of values next to each other. So it's gonna be next to each other on the heap, variable number of values. A string is a collection of characters. So we talked about strings a little bit. Uh, we mentioned the capital S string type previously, but in this chapter we'll talk about it in depth. And so you know the capital string type, um, we have an example here where we create a string from marble rye, that was our toast we ordered. So it creates this string, it's not fixed. We can modify it, we can add to it. We could have you know, added some extra characters, we could have removed characters because we used the capital S string. We also learned about the string slice prior, which is the ampersand STR. Um, and the third type of collection, a hash map, allows you to associate a value with a particular key. It's a particular implementation of a more general data structure called a map. If you've used maps in other languages where you have a key value pair, it's good for looking stuff up, right? So let's imagine we had a group of um, computers. We could key them on the ID, and the key could be the computer ID, and the value could be the properties of the computer or the name of the computer. So learn about other kinds of collections provided by the standard library, see the documentation. We'll discuss how to create and update vectors, strings, and hash maps, as well as what makes each special. Awesome, I'm here for this. I wanna learn about vectors. This is the kind of stuff like where when you start to write programs, you're gonna to have to reach for something like this, I imagine, so pretty cool. All right, storing lists of values with vectors. The first collection type we'll look at is vect. Again, t is the generic type because a vector can hold values of any type, also known as a vector. Uh, vectors allow you to store more than one value in a single data structure that puts all the values next to each other in memory. Vectors can only store values of the same type, so you can only pick one type. Unlike a tuple, where remember we said we can have a tuple that stores a string and an integer, um, maybe a, a string and a Boolean value. So vectors can only store one type, and that's why we have that generic T, because we can specify what type they're gonna store. Uh, they're useful when you have a list of items, such as the lines of text in a file or the prices of an item in a shopping cart. Lines of text in a file will be strings, prices in a shopping cart, maybe they'll be integers or floats if we're dealing with cents. Creating a new vector. To create a new ve empty vector, we can call the vector new function as shown in list listing 8.1. So I'm gonna create a new project just so, you know, we've been doing this as we go, just so we can have a place to kind of run some of this code on our own. So I'm gonna go ahead down here, uh, back up a little bit, and I'm gonna say 
um, I'm going to create a new thing for vectors. And now that it comes to me, I might at some point group these uh, by chapter. So we'll clean up the repo a little bit and group them by chapter. So keep an eye out for that. And I'll let, let, uh, let you all know on stream when, when I do that, because that'll make it a little easier to navigate. Uh, but for now, what I'll do is I'll do cargo new and we'll call it uh, vectors. And so now we have our vectors. And in here, what I'll do is I'll start just messing around with this code a little bit. So what we have here is let V and we're declaring the type. It's going to be of type signed 32 bit integer. And we have a new vector and it's, it's highlighting it in orange because we haven't yet used it. And it'll tell you that when we hover over it. Pretty cool. Okay. So that creates a new signed 32 bit integer vector. Um, Note that we added a type annotation here. Yep, because we aren't inserting any values into the ve vector, we're inserting a, a particular type. Rust doesn't know what kind of elements we intend to store. This is an important point. Vectors are implemented using generics, which we've talked about. We'll cover how to use generics with your own types in chapter 10. Man, every time, right? Every time we hop on the stream and we start learning about something, they're like, and we'll cover it more in chapter 10. So chapter 10, pff, when we get to chapter 10, we might have to throw like a little celebration. Like we might pull in like some, I might get a pinata for the back. We get, you know, we get to chapter ten. Every time we get through a chapter, we hit the pinata. You know, we all get some confetti guns. You know, just have them shoot off. Maybe we'll do. Maybe we'll do a chapter ten reveal party. You know, <laughs> whatever. Um, so yeah, chapter ten, everything's there. For now, know that the vector generic type provided by the standard library can hold any type, and when a specific vector holds a specific type, the type is specified with angle brackets. That's that. So here you see our sign 32 bit integer inside the angle brackets. That's what that's all about. In listing 8.1, we've told Rust that vec t in V will hold the elements of a sign 32 bit integer. In more realistic code, Rust can often infer the type of value you want to store once you insert value. So if I were to just insert numbers, right, it would know. Uh, so you really need to do the, you rarely need to do the type annotation. It's more common to create a vec t that has initial values and then let it infer. And Rust provides the vec exclamation point macro for convenience. The macro will create a new vector that holds the values you give it. In, and it can only ever, like we said, hold values of one type. So if you provide it initial values of a certain type, it can infer that type. Now we have to be careful with integers, right? Because if we put all unsigned integers, it might infer that it's unsigned or by default signed. So with that, we might want to be, um, oh, it says here, the integer type I32, because that's the default integer type as we discussed in data types. So let's, this is one of declaring the type. So we're going to put here explicitly declaring the type. And here we'll do letting Rust uh, infer the type. Sorry, allergies are going. All right, so to let Rust infer the type, we'll say let v inferred. I don't know if it's two hours, whatever. Equals vec, and we're using a macro here. Two, three. And let's see if we can see the type. So it's here it's sign 32 bit integer. What if I did uh just want to see what it does here? Look at that. Signed 64 bit float. Pretty cool. All right, so let's go back here to what we had. Very cool. Because we've given initial uh, sign 32 bit values, Rust can infer that the type is vector sign 32. The type annotation isn't necessary. Next, we'll look at how to modify a vector. So pretty cool. Type inference is definitely helpful. Um, it's going to give us some, you know, benefits without having to type everything. Sometimes it's nice to see the type. Um, or if you need to specify that it should be unsigned, then you could use the type because the default's I32. But that flexibility is very nice. To create a vector and then add elements to it, we can use the push method. So definitely familiar with this. If you're coming from JavaScript, we do this a bunch. So let's let's try that. Let's do um, v. Let's create a new. We have to create a mutable one, right? So let mute uh, v mutable equal vec new. And here we created using the vec new syntax, which we haven't seen yet. 
Um, but it's just like string new. Let's see what it says. Cannot infer type. So it can't infer the type of this because we haven't pushed anything onto it yet. So let's push some stuff onto it. So v mutable dot push five six seven eight. So you can see as soon as I added the code to push integers on it, it now knows the type. So pretty cool. Even though it's happening after the declaration, it can infer the type based on the code in the file because it's going to compile the code, right? So pretty pretty awesome. Uh, as with any variable, if we want to be able to change its value, we need to make it mutable using the mute keyword. The numbers we place inside are all of type sign 32 bit integer and Rust infers this from the data. So we don't need the vect i32 annotation. Dropping a vector drops its elements. Okay. Like any other struct, a vector is freed when it goes out of scope as annotated in listing 84. So here we've declared v inside a block and outside the block it's going to go out of scope so let's do that here let's do create a scope here and we'll call it let's scoped v equal vec we're going to use the macro one two three four five um say do stuff with v and then just mark like they have marked here this is good to know uh, v goes out of scope and is freed here a uh, minor thing you may have noticed that my code converted that to an arrow ligature uh, that's just the font I have font ligatures enabled and I'm using JetBrains mono which is the uh, font built for development coding by JetBrains if you may be familiar with PyCharm um, they have IntelliJ, so they they make editors, but their font is awesome, so I use it and I like the ligatures. So that's why you see that. Um, all right, so it's freed here because it's out of scope. When the vector gets dropped, all of its contents are also dropped, meaning those integers it holds will be cleaned up. Awesome, right? So that's pretty cool. This may seem like a straightforward point, but can get a bit more complicated when you start to introduce references to the elements of the vector. So if I start pointing to it, and we're gonna tackle that now, awesome. and. If anything, if you have any questions about any of the stuff we're going through, if I'm going too fast or you want some more examples or, you know, I'm learning it too, but maybe I can help, feel free to post any questions you have in the chat. And if I can't help, maybe someone else in the chat can. Reading elements of vectors. Now that you know how to create, update, and destroy vectors, knowing how to read their contents is a good next step. There are two ways to reference a value stored in a vector. In these examples, we've annotated the types of the values that are returned from these functions for extra clarity. So listing A5 shows both methods of accessing a value in a vector, either with indexing syntax or the get method. So looking like Python, right? So let's check this out. So let's just do, here I'm gonna say be inferred and I'm gonna do let third and we're gonna annotate that it's an I32. It's a reference to an I32, right? And so we're gonna grab that, grab a reference to it, and let's print it. The third element is, and we pass it third, evaluate that. Uh, and then we're gonna do a match here. So match v.get, so this is the other syntax too. Um, and here basically, because we're using get, it looks like it's returning an option. And that's why we have to match on it because it might be there and it might not. And if we look here, it's gonna say uh, get. So we see the public function get and it returns an option. So pretty cool. So we need to handle it like an option. And what does an option look like? Well, we can either have some value uh, and some code or we could have none, in which case we would do something like in this case, we're doing print ln. There is no third element. And again, uh, these things are zero index. So we're access asking for the thing at index two. So zero, one, two, which would be the third element. Common uh, programming concept, but just to be clear in case anyone's confused by that. So if we have something, we have the third, and then we can print it out. Len 
third element is third. All right, uh, this is gonna be a comma because we're in a match statement. So let's try running it. So what I'll do here is I'll pop myself in the bottom left, so I'm out of your way. And here you can see my terminal, and I'm just gonna do cargo run. You can see some warnings for unused variables, but that's not, not a problem. Um, and let's see what happens. So thread main panicked at index out of bounds, the len zero, the len is zero, but the index is two. And that's because I used V instead of V inferred, which is the one where we actually populated. So V inferred, and here we'll also do V inferred. So go down here again, and we're gonna run cargo run. And there we go, the third element is three. Third element is three. Now I'm gonna actually um, go ahead and try in this match statement to get element, the fourth element. So I'm gonna get the element at index three. Um, and we'll see if this match statement correctly returns the none type and we'll print there is no third element. We're gonna change it to fourth. All right, let's try that out. There is no fourth element. Awesome, so our match statement's pretty cool. And so the get is nice because it gives you that option. I like that. All right, let's keep going. Note two details here. First, we use the index value of two to get the third element. We talked about that. Um, second, the two ways to get the third element are by using the reference and the square brackets, which gives you a reference, or by using the get method with the index passed as an argument, which gives you an option. Uh, actually, it's an option, but it's still a reference, right? Rust has two ways to reference an element, so you can choose how the program behaves when you try to use an index value that the, ve the vector doesn't have an element for. As an example, let's see what a program will do if a vector ho that holds five elements and then tries to access an element at index 100 as shown in 8.6. So here you can see um, we have our rest station and the rest station is panicking. Uh, and if we run this, we'll see that panic happen. So thread main panicked at index out of bounds. The len is five, but the index is 100. So here we explicitly tried to get 100 and it knew it was out of bounds. And we're not handling it as an option, right? We're not explicitly handling the empty case. Uh, so that's going to be a problem. When we run this code, the first bracket method will cause the program to panic because it references a non-existent element. The method is best used when you want your program to crash if there's an attempt to access an element past the end of the vector. So if you want it to crash, use that. If you want to be able to handle it, we'll use the other way. When the get method is passed as an index that is out of the vector, it returns none without panicking. That's why we were able to run our program before. You would use this method of accessing an element beyond the range of the vector happens occasionally under normal circumstances. Um, your code will then have logic to handle having either some element or none. So <clears throat> there might be a case where, let's think of an example, right? Imagine you have a color, um, an RGB color. So you know that there's RGB, but there's also RGBA. And that last value, that fourth value is the opacity. So you could say, hey, I want to take a vector that represents an RGB or an RGBA. Obviously for this, we'd probably use an enum. Uh, but let's just say we had a function that took a vector representing an RGBA or RGB color. You could do a check to see if that fourth value is there and use the get syntax. And if you get none, then you know that you don't need to deal with opacity. Um, but if you do get a value, then you would deal with opacity. Now the get is useful because it's valid. In some cases, it's valid that that element be there. Um, so the bracket syntax would panic, you know, if that fourth opacity element wasn't there. So some, just an example of a scenario where it might be useful to use uh, get instead of the other um, case where we, we have an explicit panic. So pretty cool. Um, the index, so here we say your code will then have logic to handle both the sum or the none case. For example, the index could be coming from a person entering a number. If they accidentally enter a number that's too large and the program gets a none value, you could tell the user how many items are in the current vector and give them another chance to enter a valid value. That would be more user-friendly than crashing the program due to a typo. Pretty cool. When the program has a valid reference, the borrow checker enforces the ownership and borrowing rules. We talked about that in chapter four, and it's to ensure that this reference and any other references to the contents of the vector remain valid. Recall the rule that states you can't have mutable and immutable references in the same scope. 
So we talked about that, right? We can't have the both in the same scope, right? That rule applies in listing 8.7, where we hold an immutable reference to the first element of the vector and try to add an element to the end, which won't work if we also try to refer to the element later in the function. So here we have our question mark rest station and just the code does not compile. So pretty cool. So we have a mutable vector with five items in it. We're grabbing the first item as a reference and then we're trying to push onto V. And so let's see if we try to compile this, we get this error. Immutable borrow occurs here. So here we're grabbing an immutable borrow. We're borrowing it, right? Mutable borrow occurs here. So on this line, it tries to use V to mutate it. So in the same scope, we have an immutable borrow and a mutable borrow. And the reason this is an immutable borrow, the immutable borrow is we've declared that first is Im immutable. Um, we haven't said let mute first, right? Print the first element is this. So let's try this out and let's show where it doesn't work and then we'll show where it does work. So I'm gonna put another function in here, um, down here, let's do a function immutable So I'm just going to put this, make a very long function name, but just so we get the idea. And so we're going to do let, um, we're going to create let mute v equal vect. We're going to use the uh, macro syntax, and we're going to give it one, two, three, four, five. Also, really quick, I need to set my settings, but for now, I'm going to just change it to four. Okay. Um, Let me just do this. There we go. So we have our mutable V. So I'm going to grab an immutable. So uh, grab, I'll say perform, perform an immutable borrow. And here we'll do uh, let first equal, grab a reference to V and we'll grab the zero element, and then we'll try to push. So we'll do v.push six, and then here we'll do print ln the first element is first. Okay, and so here I don't even need to compile it because I have the IntelliSense that I'm getting from VS Code. When I hover, it says panics. How cool is this, right? Um, panics. Panics if the new capacity exceeds max bytes. But here's the thing. Cannot borrow V as mutable because it is also borrowed as immutable. So what if I do this? Well, here, even though I'm declaring first as mutable, um, it's saying the variable does not need to be mutable because we're not mutating it. But here, it's still a case where uh, cannot borrow V as mutable because it's also borrowed as immutable. So doing this here is borrowing it. It's this aspect that borrows it as immutable because we borrow a reference, right? So that will not work. So pretty cool. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and comment that out. The code in listing 8 might look like it should work. Why should a reference to the first element care about what changes at the end of the vector? This er error is due to the way vectors work. Adding a new element onto the end of the vector might require allocating new memory and copying the old elements to the new space. So interesting, pretty cool. If there isn't enough room to put all the elements next to each other where the vector currently is. So if it can't put, if you have, let's say in the heap, we've allocated four blocks and the four blocks are here, but then the blocks next to it are allocated for something else, the blocks before it are allocated to something else. If we add something on the end, there's no room. We can't do that because we're going to have to move it. And so what would happen to that thing pointing to that piece of memory? It would be, be lost, right? So that's why we can't hand, have that. In that case, the reference to the first element would be pointing to a deallocated memory. The barring rules prevent programs from ending up in that situation. So really cool. We're getting that safety harness, right? That's preventing us from doing these incorrect things. And at first, it may seem like you know difficult to work around, but we want to work with it, not around it. We want to lean on that safety. And 
although it may take longer for us to write the program while we learn these these features, ultimately we'll be writing safer code, more performant code, ideally, and leaning on that compiler to, to help us do that. So pretty cool. Note, for more on the implementation details of generic vector type, see the Rustonomicon. Should I click it? I did it, I clicked it. What is the Rustonomicon? Whoa. Interesting. We'll get to that later. Iterating over the values in a vector. If we want to access each element in a vector in turn, we can iterate through all the elements rather than use indices to access them one at a time. So loop over them, right? We're, we rarely are going to access them one at a time. Indexes, right? Listing 8.8 shows how to use a for loop to get immutable references to each element of the vector of signed 32-bit values and print them. Let's do it. So I'll create another function here. I'm going to call it loop over vector. And what we're going to do is we're going to say let v equal vec 100, 32, 57, 57. And we're going to loop over it. So for i in reference to v. Looks like a, you know, looks like a standard for loop, right? Uh, we're going to print the value. So uh, print ln. Oh, sorry about that. Let's do that. And we'll say comma i. And let's call loop over vector. So we'll call that up here. Let's clear this out. I'll get out of your way. And let's run it. There you go. 10, 32, 57. They print out. Pretty cool. Right? Loops, for loops. We need them. We need to loop sometimes. So it's good good that we have them, you know? Pretty nice. Okay. That was easy. Uh, we can also iterate over mutable references to each element in a mutable vector in order to make changes to all of the elements. The for loop will add 50 to each element. So that was an immutable. So let's put an example there. Let's just write a comment saying immutable vector loop. And here we'll do mutable vector loop. And here we'll create a mutable vector. Let mute uh, v2 equal vec uh, 100, 32, 57. And we'll do for i in v2. Uh, oh, and don't forget, we are grabbing a reference but we're grabbing a mutable reference. So, oh, sorry, I messed up. It's gotta go right here, mute. So there we grab our mutable reference for i. And here what we're gonna do is uh, get the value out of the reference. So that's what the asterisk is for. And it'll say that in a second. But we're gonna get the value and we're gonna add 50 to it, plus equals. Um, if the, that, anything about that plus equals looks weird, um, if you haven't seen that, you know, basically what that means is i equals i plus 50. Of course, we are dealing with the ampersand because we have a reference. We want to get the value at the reference, not the reference itself. So that's key there. And so we've added i to it. And so what I want to do now is I just want to go ahead and print i. So we can see it. Sorry, so print ln. Uh, we're going to do i. Oh, and here we have, oh, because I need to put a semicolon. So let's run this now. So let's see what happens when we run it with the mutable vector. So we're gonna do cargo run. There you go, 150, 82, and 107. Pretty cool. Now we're, we're writing programs, right? We're looping. Uh, we saw a loop in the guessing game, right? We saw a loop, it wasn't a for loop over a vector, it was just a loop, right? like a program loop. Now we're seeing the ability to loop over vectors. Pretty cool. All right, main large. 
To get the value that the mutable reference refers to, we have to use the dereference operator. That's the asterisk. Now you may be saying, uh-oh, flashes of C, right? You may be like, later, we're done. But don't worry, it's gonna be easier. It's not gonna be that hard. We're gonna figure it out together. It's powerful stuff. Great power, great responsibility. We can get through it. We're not just gonna throw asterisks on. I know you've all done it. I've done it. Maybe you haven't used C and then you haven't done it. But if you have, you've probably done it. You're like, oh, I'll just throw, I'll just throw an asterisk on it. That'll get me the value. Not this time. Pay attention. All right, to get the value I before we can use it. We'll talk more about the dereference operator. Don't tell me chapter, if it says chapter 10, I'm, we're walking out, right? All right, thank, thank you. Learn about it in chapter 15. Following the pointer to the value with the dereference operator. Awesome. Using an enum to store multiple types. So multiple types, right? We did this with an enum. Pardon me while I clean my glasses. At the beginning of this chapter, we said that vectors can only store values that are of the same type, right? This can be inconvenient. There are definitely use cases for needing to store a list of items of different types. Fortunately, the variants of an enum are defined under the same enum type. So when we need to store elements of different type in a vector, we can define and use an enum, right? So you can have an enum, think about the IP address. It could be of type v6, which is a string, or of type v4, which is a tuple of four unsigned 8-bit integers, right? Two different kinds of types, but they're both the same enum type. They're both the same IP address. So this is a cool workaround to get around this. For example, say we want to get values from a row in a spreadsheet in which some of the columns in the row contain integers, some contain floating point numbers, and some strings. We can define an enum whose variants will hold those different types of values and types, and then all the enum variants will be considered the same type. They'll be the type of that enum. Then we can create a vector that holds that enum and so ultimately is holding different types. <laughs> we demonstrated this in listing A10. So I'm going to create a thing here. And we're going to say vector of enums. And I'll just create the enum out here. Enum spread sheet. Oh, I like that. Spread sheet cell. And our spreadsheet cell can contain an int. That's going to be a signed 32-bit integer. Uh, we can have a float. That's going to be an F64. And text, which will be of type string. And here, our vector of enums, we're going to create let row equal vec. We're using the macro here. We're going to let it infer. And we're going to say uh, spreadsheet cell. And we're going to give it an uh, int of three. Pretty cool. We'll give it spreadsheet cell. We'll give it a text. And we're going to do string from, we're going to do orange, my favorite color. Yeah, my favorite color. Spreadsheet cell float, and we're going to do 10.12. We're not going to do 10.12. We're going to do 13.37, obviously. Well, well, there we go. Sweet. So pretty cool. Now we have a vector of enums. And just for funsies, I'm going to loop over them and print them for i in row. We're going to do print. And again, we're not grabbing a, um, we're not mutating it. So we're just going to grab a plain reference. And again, it has to be a reference like that, right? We're just going to print I. Um, and notice here, ooh, let's see, what is this complaining about? Ah, it doesn't implement standard format display. It can't be, uh, printed to that format. So remember we had to use that specific, here I'll see, pull it up. So we have this here. If we wanna print it, let me see, where did we put the printing? I think in coins maybe? We have it in a few places, yeah, derived debug. So let's pull that out, derived debug. See, I have to remember that. That's like one of those things where I'm not sure what, like I just know to do it, but I don't know what it's doing. It's like in Java when you you memorize, you know, public static main, you know, Bar, right? Void, plug, mat, stack, main, void. Eventually you know what it means, right? But at first you just kind of know to do it. So that's like this case. So I know to do this, but not totally sure why. 
I mean, we know what it does, but not what the syntax means. So I'm going to toss this on here. Uh, or not. What is it complaining about? Let's see. Arrive to bug. Does it need to be at the top? No, who knows? Let's see. Let me just move this up here. Hmm. What am I doing wrong here? It's right debug, you know. Maybe it's just a copying issue. Well, either way, we don't have to print it. We can try using the colon question mark. But basically, get rid of that. Get rid of that, get rid of that. Derive debug. Oh, it did it for me, that's pretty cool. Okay, so let me type that out, derive debug. Perfect, okay, so weird. It was creating some weird ligature when I was pasting. Okay, so we have derived debug, and then what I can do is I can do this. And now we can try it out. So let's try it out. I need to call vector of enum, so I'm just going to call that from here. Call that from here. Uh, let me move myself over here. And so we have vector of enums. I'm calling here. Semicolon there. Semicolon there. Vector of enums. We have our spreadsheet cell, which is a row, can contain an integer, a float, or a text. We've created it here, and we're going to just try printing it out. And there we go, int three text orange float 13.7. And it's printing out that whole thing because we used our debug derive and we're just printing out what it is. Pretty cool. All right, so now we have a vector that can actually store different types of values because we're using that enum and it's only storing the type of the enum. In this case, it's storing spreadsheet cells. And if you look, if I hover over row, it says right there, row is a generic type of type spreadsheet cell, pretty cool. Powerful stuff, powerful stuff. Okay, Rust needs to know what types will be in the vector at compile time. So it knows exactly how much memory on the heap will need to be allocated to store each element. A secondary advantage is that we can be explicit about what types are allowed in this vector. So we won't be able to push on arbitrary things. If Rust allowed a vector to hold any type, there would be a chance that one or more of the types would cause errors with the operations performed on the elements of the vector. For example, let's say you have a, let's talk about JavaScript or Python. Um, imagine you have a list uh, or an array in, in JavaScript and you have, um, you're expecting an array of strings, right? And at some point in your code, you do a loop over this array and you do a loop over this array and you substring or you call trim. You want to trim all of the lines of text. So let, let's say, for example, you have a file and you parse it and you want all the lines of text. So you store them in an array and you expect your array to contain all strings. And then what you want to do is remove white space. So you write a loop that loops over set array and trims each of the lines to remove the white space. Now, what if at some point your code manipulated that array and added a number um, or an integer? Well, that number integer does not define a trim function. So you would get an error that says, you know, cannot call trim or function trim undefined. So that this prevents things like that. If you have functionality that expects a certain type, we can safely write loops and, and code in a way that says, you know, this is guaranteed to, be to, guaranteed to be of this type. So we can infer that all code that operates on something of this type will work, right? So very cool, very safe stuff. We can achieve this with TypeScript, right? Um, but we have to make sure, you know, we can't achieve someone at runtime pushing on a value that's not um, of the correct type, right? So pretty cool that we get this here. So um, if Rust allowed a vector of a new type, there'd be a chance that one or more types would cause errors when an operation is performed. Using an enum plus a match expression means that Rust will ensure at compile time that every possible case is handled. When you're writing a program, if you don't know the exhaustive set of types the program will get at runtime to store in a vector, 
the enum technique won't work. So let's repeat that because it's important. When writing a program, if you don't know the exhaustive set of types the program will get at runtime to store in a vector, the enum technique won't work. Instead, you can use a trait object. We'll cover those in chapter 17. We've already used one, right? The copy trait, remember? That's talking about copy. Be right back. Regolo app, no problem. We'll be here. Now that we've discussed some of the most common ways to use vectors, be sure to review the API documentation for all the many useful methods to find on vector by the standard library. For example, in addition to push and pop, method uh, removes and returns last element. Oh, in addition to push, a pop method removes and returns last element. Yes, familiar with that. If you've used JavaScript, we have that, right? Let's move on to the next collection type, string. Before we do that, I do want to take a quick look at the documentation. I want to see, you know, in um, JavaScript, for example, we can map over a, a list or an array. In Python, we can use uh, list comprehensions, right? We can reduce over lists and stuff like that. So I wanted to see uh, if any of that functionality is available to a vector. So vector pop, we can get the length, pretty cool. Let's see what else we get. Indexing, slicing. So we can grab a slice from a vector. A vector can be it can be mutable. Slices, on the other hand, are read-only objects. So we can get a slice from a vector. Uh, let's see what else. With capacity, into raw parts, from raw parts, capacity, reserve, try reserve. Let's see, shrink to fit, shrink to truncate. So we can truncate two. So it truncates the vector to length two. That's pretty cool. And look, they're writing tests here. That's pretty sweet. As slice, so we can get a vector as a slice. That's pretty cool. As a mutable slice. Pointer. Pretty cool. Swap remove. Swap remove one bar, so it takes out, let's see what this does. Vector foo bar baz, qui? Swap remove one bar, so it just takes out bar. So if starting at bar, it takes out one. Swap remove zero foo. Wait, so, it, oh, ooh, swap remove one. That's pretty cool. So we're removing one bar. So it's saying swap remove, we expect it to remove bar, it removes bar, this is an assert, that's why I read that funny. Removes bar, we can swap remove zero, remove the first one, that's pretty cool. Insert, I'm assuming this lets you insert at an index, so let's see. Vector one, two, three, one, insert four, so it's gonna insert one. At index one, insert four, did that there. At index four, insert five, zero, one, two, three, four, and inserted five, pretty cool. Remove, remove lets you remove one of the items, that's pretty cool. So what is the difference between remove and swap remove? Oh, swap remove, sw oh, interesting. This is interesting. Swap remove removed bar from the list and swapped baz and qui. Here, swap remove removed foo and swap those back, pretty cool. So, removes an element from a vector and returns it. The removed element is replaced by the last element of the vector. This does not preserve ordering. Oh, okay, interesting, that's all. Uh, pretty cool, retain, let's see what else. Dedupe, dedupe by, push that we know about, pop, we know about that, append. So append is gonna allow us to append another vector to this vector, I'm assuming if they're the same type, obviously. Drain creates a draining iterator that removes the specified range in the vector and yields the removed items. Very cool. Clear, length, is empty, split off, resize with, leak, spare capacity, resize, extend from, remove item, splice, drain fill. So a lot of stuff, pretty cool. Uh, we'll hopefully be able to use some more of that stuff, but very, very cool stuff. All right. What is the Rust Anomicon? Dark arts of unsafe rust. Whoa. I don't know. I'm not ready. 
I'm not ready for the dark side of the force. So let's stick, uh, let's stick here for now. So pretty cool. All right, now let's learn about string. We know a little bit about string, right? We're not noobs. We're not total noobs. We're, we're like kind of rustations. We've grown our first claw, I think. All right, let's learn about strings, though. We talked about strings in Chapter 4. Yeah. Duh. But we'll look at them in more depth now. New rustations. That's us. That's us. The new rustations. That's like our band name. It's like the new radicals, but rust version, right? Pretty cool. Yeah, pretty spooky stuff. It's Halloween, so maybe we should read the Rust Denomicon. Get like a skull. I can put like a skull on the stream. Spooky. Okay. So, you saw it here. We put a skull on the stream for the spooky stuff. All right. Anyway, we talked about strings, right? New rust stations commonly get stuck on strings for a combination of three reasons. That's us. We're new. Rust, propensity for exposing possible errors. Strings being a more complicated data structure than many programs give them credit for. Don't underestimate the string. Is that G Fuel in the bottle? What bottle? This bottle? Oh, no, no, no. The G Fuel is over here. It's already been consumed. Thanks for asking, though. In my favorite color, orange. Bruce Campbell programs us to freedom. Tank. Tank is here. He's rolling in. He's showing up. Welcome, Tank. All right. Strings. Complicated. Let's find out why. These factors... Oh, and UTF-8, which is the third reason. These factors combine in a way that can seem difficult when you're coming from other programming languages. That's me. Maybe it's you. It's useful to discuss strings in the context of collections because strings are implemented as collections of bytes. Plus, some methods to provide useful functionality when those bytes are interpreted as text. So you may have asked, when we mentioned it earlier, we're going to be covering vectors, strings, and hash maps when we're talking about collections. You may have been like, well, strings, like collections. I'm thinking like lists, like hash maps, but strings. Well, strings are, like they said here, collections of bytes. So we're going to treat them the same way. So pretty cool. In this section, we'll talk about operations on string that every collection type has, such as creating, updating, and reading. We'll also discuss the ways in which string is different from the other collections. So it has some differences, right? Namely, how indexing into a string is complicated by the differences between how people and computers interpret string data. Very cool. What is a string? This is a question I get a lot. People ask me, you know, as programmers, I use the term string. I'm very familiar with it. I can relate string, I think, of a sentence or text in quotes. But when you're talking to somebody who's never programmed, how do you explain a string, right? It's like oh, the word, it's the text, the quotes. But this is a good explanation here. We'll first define what we mean by the term string. Rust has only one string type in its core language, which is the string slice, str, lowercase str, core language, String slice. That's usually seen in its borrowed form, ampersand string. In chapter four, we talked about string slices, which are references to some UTF-8 encoded string data stored elsewhere. So it's not, st right, stored elsewhere. That's the key, on the heap. String literals, for example, are stored in the program's binary and therefore, and are therefore string slices. So the string literal, when we just declare a fixed string, not using the string from. The string type, which is provided by Rust standard library rather than coded into the core language, is growable, mutable, and owned. UTF-8 encoded string type. When Rust stations refer to strings in Rust, they usually mean the capital S string type and the string slice types. Not just one of those types. So we're talking about both. So I guess when Rust stations, which we're going to become if we're not already, some of you may already be, when we refer to strings, we mean the string and the string slice types, not just one of those types. Although this section is largely about capital S string, both types are used heavily in Rust standard library and both string and string slices are UTF-8 encoded. All right, Rust standard library also includes a number of other string types such as OS string, OSSTR, C string, and CSTR. Library crates can provide even more options for storing string data. 
see how those names all end with string, capital S, or STR, capital S? They refer to owned and borrowed variants, just like the string and STR types you've seen previously. These string types can store text in different encodings and be represented in memory in a different way. For example, we won't discuss these other string, sorry, for example, read that wrong. We won't discuss these other string types in this chapter, see their API documentation for more about how to use them and when each is appropriate. All right, creating a new string. We've done this many times. What I'm gonna do though, is I'm going to create a new folder in here. Uh, I'm gonna call it collections and I'm gonna group strings under here so that we know it's part of the collections chapter. Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say projects, chapter eight, We'll call it chapter, uh, we'll just do it like this. Chapter eight, collections. And I'm gonna go ahead and move our vectors in here. That's not working. There we go. Chapter eight, oh, it moved everything. So hold on, hold on. That's not a problem. Let's move that, move that. All right, so we have source, that's our vectors, right? Okay, so I'm just gonna create a new folder here. And let's move all of this in here. Move. Move, sorry, my paste isn't working for some reason. Okay, so now we have vectors in chapter eight. Uh, what I'm gonna do is create another replace. Okay, uh, I see what it did. It didn't, it kept the folder, it just put it here, sorry. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna create another folder called strings so that we can mess with our strings in here. So what I'll do is clear this. Uh, I'm gonna go back up a directory. We're gonna go into chapter, GD chapter eight. We have vectors here. I'm gonna do cargo new strings. There we go, we have strings. We got our main strings file and now let's mess with strings. All right. Let's go back over here. Okay, so let's create a mutable string, easy. String. Straightforward. These lines create a new empty string called S, which can then load data into. Often we'll we'll have some initial data that we want to start the string with, and we've done this a bunch of times. For that, we'll use the two string method, which is available on any type that implements the display trait, as string literals do. Show two examples. So let's do this here. So we have data, data, and this is a string literal. initial contents and we'll do let s equal data dot to string and then let s oh and this method also works on a literal directly so we'll say uh, the above is equivalent to and then we'll just do it in the comments. We'll say let s equal initial contents dot to string. And you're gonna see, we've already used a simpler version of this, which we're gonna cover here. This code creates a string containing initial contents. We can also use the function string from to create a string from a string literal. And that's what we've been doing for the most part. Also, let s equal string from initial contents. So now we've seen a few different ways to initialize a string. Very cool. All right, because strings are used for so many things, we can use many different generic APIs for strings, providing us with a lot of options. Some of them can seem redundant, but they all have their place. So pretty cool. In this case, string from and to string do the same thing. So which you choose is a matter of style. 
Remember that strings are UTF-8 encoded, so we can include any properly encoded data in them as shown in listing 814. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this so we can have it here. Pretty cool. This is great. Nice. All of these are valid string values. Updating a string. A string can grow in size and its contents can change. All right. Just like the contents of a generic vector, if you push, or we just call it vector, if you push more data into it, it can change. In addition, you can conveniently use the plus operator or the format macro to concatenate string values. We can grow a string by using the push string method to append a string slice as shown in listing 815. So let's do that. So let's do um, let mute. Um, new string new s let's do s2 equal string from foo s dot push tr bar um, and here we have an issue it's because we're referencing s there you go s2 uh, after these two lines s will contain foo bar the push string method takes a string slice because we don't necessarily want to take ownership of the parameter for example, the code in listing 816 shows that it would be unfortunate if we weren't able to use S2 after appending its contents to S1. So we have S1. Let's make S1. Uh, we can do let S2 equal bar. And then we'll do S1.push str S2. And then if we try to use S2, uh, one, I'm sorry, if we try to use S2, let's do print ln S2 is and then S2. Let's see what happens when we run this. So I'm going to go bottom left here. And S2 is bar, so that worked. Um, but if it wasn't a string slice, we wouldn't be able to use S2 after pushing it here. It would have modified it but because it treats it as a string slice. We're good. If the push string method took ownership of S2, we wouldn't be able to print its value on the last line. However, this code works as we'd expect. If the push string method, uh, the push method takes a single character as a parameter and adds it to the string. So instead of push string, it can add a single character. Uh, so here we have adding a single character. So let's do that here. Let's mute S3 equal la. And we're going to do a string from, string from. And then we'll do s dot, s3 dot push. And we'll push an L to make a low, full low. Right? Pretty cool, low. Oh, here, let's see. Uh, we need to push a character, not a string. So that's why we use the single quotes. As a result of this code, we'll contain lol, or not grace, lol. If you're on Twitch, you know, you understand. We're doing the lols here. Concatenation with the plus operator or the format macro, which they mentioned previously. So let me move over here. All right. Often you want to combine two existing strings. One way is to use the plus operator, as shown in listing 818. Using the plus operator to combine new strings values into a new string value. Let's try that out. I'm going to just create a new function. Cat with, or let's call it combine strings with plus. And we'll just do let mute. Oh, let's do let s1 equal string from hello. Let s2 equals string from Twitch. And we'll do let s3 equal s1 plus. Oh, and look at this, s2. Let's put that note here. Note s1 has been moved here, so it can no longer be used because we didn't use the reference. Interesting. Um, and again, we need to close that out. The string S3 
will contain hello Twitch in our case as a result of this code. The reason S1 is no longer valid after the addition and the reason we used a reference to S2 has to do with the signature of the method that gets called when we use the plus operator. The plus operator uses the add method whose signature looks something like this. Self and a reference to a string. This isn't the exact signature that's in the standard library. In the standard library, add is defined using generics. Here we're looking at the signature of add with concrete types substituted for the generic ones, which is what happens when we call this method with string. So let's repeat that, it seems important. Here we're looking at the signature of add with concrete types substituted for the generic ones, because it usually takes generic types, which is what happens when we call this method with string values. We'll discuss generics in chapter 10. The sign chapter 10 again. Come on. The signature gives us clues we need to understand the tricky bits of the plus operator. First, S2 has an ampersand, meaning that we're adding a reference of the second string to the first string because of the S parameter in the add function. We can only add a, an ampersand string to a string. We can't add two string values together. But wait, the type of ampersand S2 is a string reference, not lowercase str as specified in the second parameter to add. So why doesn't it why does it compile? So what they're saying here is the type of S2 is capital S string. And here we're creating a reference. So the type here of S2, if we look, is going to be of type, it's a reference to capital S string. But the add, let's see if it lets me hover over the plus. It doesn't. Well, what the signature for the add you can see here is lowercase str. So why does it work? The reason we're able to use ampersand s2, a reference s2, in the call to add is that the compiler can coerce the reference to the capital S string argument into a string slice. When we call the add method, Rust uses a defer, uh, sorry, a deref coercion. Yo, <sighs> sit on that for a little bit. A deref coercion, which here turns the referenced s2 into a string slice. Mm. Look at that. Wow. We'll discuss deref coercion in more depth in chapter 15. Because add does not take ownership of the s parameter, s2 will still be a valid string after this operation. So s1 won't be. s2 will be. Interesting. Second, we see that the signature in add takes ownership of self because self does not have an ampersand. That's the S1 in this case, right? This means S1 enlisting 818 will be moved into add call and no longer be valid after that. So it gets moved here, right? Will no longer be valid. So although let S3 equal S1 plus the reference S2 looks like it will copy both strings and create a new one, this statement actually takes ownership of S1 appends a copy of the contents of S2 and then returns ownership of the result. In other words, it looks like it's making a lot of copies, but isn't. The implementation is more efficient than copying. Let's look at this. It's not creating copies. If we need to concatenate multiple strings, the behavior of the plus operator gets unwieldy. So here you can see string tic-tac-toe. I'm going to go ahead and make this happen. I'm just going to copy it because it's just a lot of typing and I'm not benefiting from typing this over and over. Um, let's delete that, delete that. All right, so we have S1, S2, S3, and S. And so here we're saying S1, tick, dash, tack, dash, toe. Um, at this point, S will be tick, tack, toe with all the plus and quote characters. It's difficult to see what's going on. For more complicated string combining, we can use the format macro. So what it's saying is it will contain the plus and quote characters, which is not what we want. So let's let's print it and see actually what it, what it looks like. So let's do print ln s is, and let's call this function. And let's run it. Get out of your way here. Clear and cargo run. 
So look, S is tic-tac-toe, so it worked. But we have a lot of plus, dash, it gets complicated. We want like a string template kind of, right? Okay. We kind of did this with println, right? And if you've used Python, you've probably used something similar. In JavaScript, we use template strings. It just makes these things a lot easier to do. So let's do this. Let's do let s equal. We're going to do the format macro. Let s equal format. And then we'll do, and it's positional arguments. So it's going to know we got to put it in the right order s1, s2, s3. I'm just going to put here is equivalent to pretty cool. So let's run that here again. And there you go, tic tac toe. And it looks a little nicer. It's like a nice little formatting, similar to what we do with when we uh, when we log, right? With println. So pretty cool. All right. So the code also sets S to tic-tac-toe. The format macro works in the same way as print LN, but instead of printing the output to the screen, it returns a string with its contents. The version of the code using format is much easier to read and doesn't take ownership of any of its parameters. Yo, that's fire, right? That's pretty cool. And look, we could probably see that it printed out what S was. And we can probably also print out what S2 is here. So let's do that. Let's try that out. Well, let's do S1, because that was the one that we had the issue with before. Clear that, and I'm just going to move over here, and cargo run. There you go, S1 is ticked, so it doesn't take ownership, so super cool. All right, indexing into strings. Restation's back. Let's go. Indexing into strings. In many other programming languages, Accessing individual characters in a string by referencing them by index is a valid and common operation. However, if you try to access parts of a string using index syntax in Rust, you'll get an error. Consider the invalid code in 8.19. Let s1 string from hello, h s10. So it's trying to access that h, right? It will result in an error, and we can see the error here. The trait standard ops index integer is not implemented for capital S string aborting due to error. And then it says we can get more information about the error. And it says here, string cannot be indexed by integer. So pretty cool. Uh, the error and the note tell the story. Rust strings don't support indexing, but why not? To answer that question, we need to discuss how Rust stores strings in memory. Internal representation. So how is it being stored? A string is a wrapper over a vector of an unsigned 8-bit integer or a byte, right? Uh, sorry, unsigned 8 bit, in, yeah, so vector of unsigned 8 bit integer. Let's look at some of our properly encoded UTF 8 example strings from listing 814 for this one. So, hello, string from hola. In this case, len will be 4, so the length of that string will be 4, which means the vector storing the string hola is 4 bytes long, right? Because unsigned 8 bit integer represents a byte, 4 bytes long. Each of these letters takes 1 byte when encoded in UTF 8. But what about the following line? Note that this string begins with the capital Cyrillic letter, Cyrillic, sorry, Cyrillic letter Z, -E, Z, not the Arabic number three. So, look at that. Look at those characters. Hello. Asked how long the string is, you might say 12. If you were to just, you know, count the characters, you'd say 12. However, Rust's answer is 24. That's the number of bytes it takes to encode that string in UTF-8. Because each Unicode scalar value in the string takes two bytes of storage, therefore an index into the string's bytes will not always correlate to a valid Unicode scalar value, right? You might get, you'll get like half. I mean, you wouldn't, it wouldn't work like that. But if you need two bytes to represent one of those characters, you can't just grab an index if an index represents a byte. Pretty interesting stuff. To demonstrate, consider the invalid Rust code, hello, and it's trying to grab a reference to zero. What should the value of answer be? Should it be three, the first letter? When encoded in UTF-8, the first byte three is 208, and the second is 151. So answer should, in fact, be 208, 
but 2.8 is not a valid character on its own. Returning 2.8 is likely not what a user would want if they asked for the first letter of the string. However, that's the only data that Rust has at byte index zero. Users generally don't want the byte value return, even if the string contains only Latin letters, like hello. They want the letter, right? Where valid code that returned a byte value will return 104, not H. To avoid returning an unexpected value and causing bugs that might not be discovered immediately, Rust doesn't compile this code at all and prevents misunderstandings early in the development process. So that's interesting that it, it handles it that way. Pretty cool. Bytes and scalar values and grapheme clusters. Oh my. Bytes and scalar values and graphing clusters. Oh my. Look at this. What language is this? Another point about UTF-8 is that there are actually three relevant ways to look at strings from Rust's perspective as bytes, scalar values, and vectors. Sorry, bytes, scalar values, and grapheme clusters. The closest thing to what we would call letters, grapheme clusters. Whoa, pretty interesting. If we look at the Hindi word, I'm not gonna say, I don't know how to say it. Pretty cool. I like it. Looks cool. Looks fancy. Written in Devanagari script, it is stored as a vector of unsigned 8 bit integer values that look like this. Pretty cool. That looks awesome. That's 18 bytes. And it's how computers ultimately store this data. If we look at them in Unicode scalar values, which are what Rust's char type is, bytes look like this. Pretty cool, the individual letters. Look at how it's able to combine those. That's super, super fascinating. So that's really, really cool to me. Nice. There are six car values here, but the fourth and six are not letters. Uh, they're diacritics, diacritics that don't make sense on their own. Finally, if we look at them as grapheme clusters, we'd get what a person would call the four letters that make up the Hindi word. So pretty cool, it's like combining. So check this out. See that circular outline? This is representing the accent that gets applied to the character preceding it. And you can see here, this gets applied here. So that's why it looks like this. That's super interesting, that's really cool. Rust provides different ways of interpreting the raw string data that computers store so that each program can choose the interpretation it needs no matter what human language the data is in. That's awesome, right? So we can do it with any language. The final reason Rust doesn't allow us to use index into a string to get a character is that indexing operations are expected to always take constant time, order one, right? If you're indexing, you want it to be constant. That's why we use it. But it isn't possible to guarantee that performance with a string because Rust would have to walk through the constants of the beginning to the index to determine how many valid characters there were. That's super interesting. So it can't guarantee order one performance because it has to walk through the contents from the beginning to the index to determine how many valid characters there were. Wow, that's super cool. Slicing strings. Indexing into a string is often a bad idea because it's not clear what the return type of the string indexing operation should be. A byte value, a character, or a grapheme cluster, or a string slice. Therefore, Rust asks you to be more specific if you really need to use indices to create string slices. To be more specific in your indexing and indicate that you want a string slice rather than indexing using bracket notation with a single number. You can use bracket notation with a range to create a string slice containing particular bytes. So here we have hello. We're grabbing zero to four. We saw this, we saw this previously in chapter four. Here's, here S will be a string that contains the first four bytes of the string. Earlier we mentioned that each of these characters was two bytes, which means S will be that. Pretty cool. What would happen if we used 0 0.1? The answer, Russ would panic at runtime in the same way as if an invalid index were accessed. You're trying to only grab one. Let's look at the panic. Panic at byte index one is not a car boundary, a character boundary. It is inside three. Bytes here are the two of, so pretty cool. You should use ranges to create string slices with caution because doing so can crash your program. Huh. 
methods for iterating over strings. Fortunately, you can access elements in a string in other ways. If you need to perform operations on individual Unicode scalar values, the best way to do so is to use the cars method. We, we did this, right? We looped over the characters. It's pretty cool. Calling cars on that word separates out and returns six values of type car, and you can iterate over the result to access each element. And this is what we did. We did this before, right? Let me pull that up. We did this in our Fahrenheit converter. Pull this up here. Let me get out of your way. So we did it in our Fahrenheit converter. If you remember, we took in the temperature that the user typed, right? We took in the temperature the user typed, and we looked for the presence of the Fahrenheit, F, or the C. And the way we did that was um, we grabbed the bytes, right? So in this case, we didn't use cars. We actually, sorry, we used bytes. So we grabbed the bytes, looped over them, and looked for those individual things. But car is, is another one we could use. So that's pretty cool. Nice. All right. Let's pop back over here. Methods for iterating over strings. So let's do that. I want to iterate over a string. So let's go over here to our strings. And let's create a new function here. I'm going to move myself up to the bottom left here. I'm going to scroll this up. Um, and I'm going to create a new function called iterating over strings. And let's do for b in. I'm going to just copy this. Let's see if it copies correctly. Wow. And let's print out that character. So print oh, my spaces. I got to fix this. Uh, um, I got to change my settings. Print ln b. All right. So let's see. Clear that. Cargo run. Oh, first we had to call this function, iterating over strings. All right, cargo run. Oh, there we go. Get an individual cars. And look, you see the code will print 18 bytes that make up the string. Be sure to remember that valid Unicode scalar values may be made up of more than one byte. Getting graphene clusters from strings is complex, so this functionality is not provided by the standard library. Crates are available, though, to get this functionality. So we couldn't get the individual clusters, but interesting. Strings are not so simple. Sorry, let me move over out of your way again. Strings are not so simple. To summarize, strings are complicated. Different program languages make different choices about how to present this complexity to the programmer. Some make it really simple, um, and Rust presents it in a, in a way that is maybe a little more complex, but maybe a little safer. Rust has chosen to make the correct handling of string data the default behavior for all Rust programs, which means programmers had to put more thought into handling UTF-8 data up front. This trade-off exposes more of the complexity of strings than is apparent in other languages, but it prevents you from having to handle errors involving non-ASCII characters later in your development lifecycle. Let's switch to something a bit less complex, hash maps. So we talked about this, right? The trade-offs. Um, they're explicitly making and exposing the complications to the programmer, but the value is that you're going to avoid having issues further down the road when we deal with these characters. So it's some languages you may say, well, I've never actually had any issues, um, but maybe we weren't dealing with the same characters. We were dealing with simple strings. Um, and maybe, you know, you weren't doing any, some, maybe we didn't end up needing to do some type of string manipulation that it requires to get a little lower level into the bytes of things. Um, so it's a design choice of the language and something that we'll, we'll get used to if we continue working with it. So pretty cool. All right, let's see how much time we have left. Oh, good. We have a half hour. We're great. Let's do hash maps. Oh, sorry. Ooh. All right. Again, any questions, anything at all, pop it in the chat. Happy to answer. If you're on YouTube, there's no chat, obviously. You're watching it after the live stream. That's fine. Put it in the comments. I check the comments pretty regularly and happy to answer any questions there as well. Okay. Storing keys with associated values in hash maps. All right, so I'm going to create a new, you know I'm creating a new project for hash maps. So let me just go ahead and 
uh, clear this out. I'm just going to run cargo. Let me back up a little bit. Run cargo new hash maps. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open up hash maps. Cool. Good to go. All right, the last of our common collections. Ready for it? Hash map. The type hash map key value. That's what that means. Excuse me. The type hash map key value stores a mapping of keys of type K and values of type V. It does this via a hashing function, which determines how to place these keys and values into memory. Many programming languages support this kind of data structure, but they often use a different name, such as hash, map, object, hash table, dictionary, associative array, just to name a few. In JavaScript, we have objects. In Python, we have dictionaries, right? Um, it's key value pairs. Those are just different ways to name it. So I'm glad they called that out. That's pretty cool. Hash maps are useful when you want to look up data, not by using an index, as you can with vectors, but by using a key that can be of any type. So in JavaScript, sometimes we'll use strings to uh, represent it. You know, in an object, we generally use strings as the keys. And those strings can represent something else. They could be an ID. Uh, we can access them in a variable way, right? We can pass a variable. Um, that's value is string A, and it'll grab the thing at index string A. Uh, we know that arrays in JavaScript are just objects where the um, index is a number, right? The key is a number. So in a hash map situation, uh, the keys can be of any type, right? For example, in a game, you can keep track of each team's score in a hash map in which each key is a team's name and the values are each team's score. Given a team name, you can retrieve its store. And that's ideally order one, right? Because it's indexed. We'll go over the basic API of hash maps in this section, but many more goodies are hiding in the functions defined on HashMap KV in the standard library. As always, check the standard library documentation for more information. And we'll check it out for sure. Creating a new hash map. All right. Is there, there's got to be, there's got to be an app out there that finds like legal cannabis stores called HashMap, right? Come on. Low hanging fruit here. There's not. You heard it here, TM. Got to be, right? HashMap, come on. All right, so you can create an empty HashMap with the new <clears throat> and add elements with insert. In listing A20, we're keeping track of the scores of two teams whose names are blue and yellow. Blue and red. We're going to use blue and yellow. Blue team starts with 10 points, and the yellow team starts with 50. So let's go ahead and do this. So we're going to pull in hash map. So use, again, remember, this is referencing a library or crate standard. What do we want to use from it? We want to use the collections. And from that, let's see if I can get a little autocomplete going. Let me just try something. I just want to put, make sure this compiles. Chicken pie when it's empty, right? Let's go. Let's put this back. Let's go back to what we had here. I just want to see if we get any audit complete going. So, uh, what happened? All right. So use. No, I'm not getting. That's all right. We can look it up. So I'm gonna pull in hash map, and then here, if I hover over it, I do get the docs for hash map. So pretty cool. I wish it did auto complete, but this is awesome. Right? Pretty cool. <laughs> All right, so that's awesome. So here what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, let mute mutable scores equal hash map new. And I'm sure there's gonna be a way to initialize it like there was with strings. We'll see that in a second. Uh, score, I'm sure, scores.insert string, sorry. Uh, why did that not work? That's interesting. Um, so we got string from blue, and we're gonna insert the score. We're gonna give them a score of 10, and we're gonna do scores insert from red, classic blue and red team, like Halo, you know, come on, yellow team. Okay, um, now that we need to first use the hash map, 
so notice no, we need to pull it in, right? Uh, from the collection portion of the standard library. Of our three common collections, this one is the least often used. So it's not included in the features brought into scope automatically by the prelude. That's why we need to pull it in. Hash maps also have less support from the standard library. There's no built-in macro to construct them, for example. Just like vectors, hash maps store their data on the heap. The hash map has keys of type string and the values in this case of type signed 32-bit integer. Like vectors, hash maps are homogeneous. All of the keys must have the same type and all the values must have the same type. Interesting. I'm sure we can use enums though too. Another way of constructing a hash map is by using iterators and the collect method on a vector of tuples, where each tuple consists of a key and its value. So if you have key value pairs, red, 10, blue, three, we can construct the hash map by looping over a vector of those tuples. We'll be going into more detail about iterators and their associated methods in processing a series of items and iterators, section of chapter 13. The collect method gathers data into a number of collection types, including hash map. For example, if we had the T names and initial scores in two separate vectors, we could use the zip method to create a vector of tuples where blue is paired with 10, so the team name is paired with its scores, and so forth. Then we could use the collect method to turn that vector of tuples into a hash map. Let's do that. I'm going to create another function here. Vector of tuples to hash map. All right, so we got um, let teams equal a new vector. And again, I'm just, I could copy, I'm just typing it out for the muscle memory of it. For, for me, learning the programming language, it's important to type it out, get a feel for using it. Just reading it doesn't do it for me. It's like taking notes, you know, you memorize things more when you take notes, at least some people do. <laughs> All right, so we string from blue, we're gonna do string from yellow, red in our case, so we have the two team names. Oh, sorry, that's my bin binding there. From red, okay, close that out. And then let initial scores equal a vector of sine 32 bit integers. We're just gonna say 1050. All right. Um, and now we're gonna create a hash map from these two vectors. We're gonna zip them up and create a hash map. So mute scores hash map. Interesting syntax equals teams dot into iter sorry iterate it so create an iterate from teams dot zip initial scores dot into iter so we want an iteratable and then we're going to collect and so into iter iter creates an iterable we can see that here creates an iterator from a value. So from this vector, we create an iterable. From here, we have an iterable. We zip them up. If you look at what zip does, um, zips up two iterators into a single iterator of pairs. We get a, a tuple is what we're going to get from that. And collect can take anything iterable and turn it into a relevant collection. And the collection we've chosen here is hash map. So scores is a type hash map of type string 32 bit integer. Very, very cool. The type annotation <clears throat> hash map underscore comma underscore is needed here because it's possible to collect into many different data structures and Rust doesn't know which one you want unless you specify. So we collect into a hash map and so we specified. For the parameters of the key and the value types, however, we use underscores. And Rust can infer the types that the hash map contains based on the types of the data in the vectors. As you see, it did. I'm just going to put a comment here so that's clear. Okay, so we have our iter. Okay, so mute scores, hash map. Um, okay, so teams into iter, zip initial scores, collect. Perfect. So here we have, it infers the type as string i32. All right, there we go. Awesome. We aren't able to use the, okay, wait, here we go. So. Perfect. Hash maps and ownership. 
For types that implement the copy trait, like I32, the values are copied into the hash map. For own values like string, the values will be moved and the hash map will be the owner of those two of those values as demonstrated in listing 822. So here we have this. So again, the values are copied into the hash map. For own values like string, so remember I32 is copy, that was the trait. Uh, the values will be moved and the hash map will be the owner of those values. So we will lose them in that vector. So here we can do, try this. ownership and hash maps, just create a function. Uh, I'm just going to copy this part because I typed it already a bunch of times. And then what I'm going to do here is let mute map equal hash map dot new or colon colon new. And we're going to say map dot insert field name comma field value. So here it says they're invalid. We can try using them. It'll, it'll show us right in our editor, luckily. So let's do that. So I'm going to just do this. So let's try using it and see what it says. Print ln. So we're going to print. We're going to see what happens when we try to use it. And there you go right away. Value borrowed here after move. Borrow of move value. So cool. We aren't able to use the variables field name and field value after they've been moved into the hash map with the call to insert. If we insert references to values into the hash map, the values won't be moved into the hash map. The values that the references point to must be valid for at least as long as the hash map is valid. We'll talk more about these issues in validating references and lifetimes. Chapter 10, chapter 10, for my table, chapter 10. I'm so excited for chapter 10 though. They're going to be so much. I don't know how they're going to squeeze it in. We'll see. Accessing values in a hash map. We can get a value out of a hash map by providing its key to the get method as shown in listing 823. So let's do that here. So we have our teams. Let's get some values. So we'll do let team name equal string from blue. And I'll say let score equal scores.get. And we're going to get, use a reference to team name. And then here we'll do print len. Uh, we'll do score is do team name, comma, score. And again, we used a reference, so it didn't take it, right? Um, so we can still use this value. And it's a macro, so I gotta use that. Oh, actually, wait, let's see. Ah, score doesn't implement format display. So let's try this. And let's go ahead and comment this out. And let's try to run it. Get out of your way here. Clear this out. Cargo run. Some 10. Oh, yeah, it's an option. So there you go. That's pretty cool. It returns an option. Blue score is some 10. Pretty cool. And we can see that here. They're going to explain that it is, in fact, an option. So here, uh, score will have the value that's associated with the blue team, and the result will be some 10. The result is wrapped in sum because the get returns an option. If there's no value for that key in the hash map, get will return the none type. The program will need to handle the option in one of the ways that we covered in chapter six. We can iterate over each key value pair in a hash map in a similar manner that we do with vectors using a for loop. So let's do that. So let's do um, four key values. So we've seen stuff like this, right? Like entries for key value in. So pretty nice way to loop over it. Scores, Oop. change that there. Uh, we're going to do, oh, again, my space is, I got to change it. Every file is going to have this issue until I change it. Um, don't worry, I will do it. So for, uh, let's just do this. Um, we have the key and the value, so we're going to print ln. And we'll do, 
underscore is let's try that now what's interesting is here we had to use this because it was uh, option type and here they didn't do that um, let's see what happens move out of your way again put this up here and let's run cargo run oh so interesting so in this case because I looped over it um, I didn't need to because I didn't use the dot get that's why when you use the dot get it may not be there but since I'm looping it's defined to be there because it's going to go through each one so pretty cool so it doesn't return an option in this case I like that and it makes sense so that's our loop the code will print out each pair in an arbitrary order. Updating a hash map, right? So we want to be able to update these things. Although the number of keys and values is growable, each key can only have one value associated with it at a time. When you want to change the data in a hash map, you have to decide how to handle the case when a key already has a value assigned. You could replace the old value with the new value, completely disregarding the old value. You could keep the old value and ignore the new value, only adding the new value if the key doesn't already have a value, right? So if the key doesn't have a value, add it. If it does, just don't, you know, don't add it. Almost like a set, right? Or you could combine the old value and the new value. Let's look at how to do each of these. So let's do a new function here, overwriting a value and we're going to create a new let's copy this here let mute scores equal hash map new and we're going to do we're just going to copy this is the same code from up here so let's just copy that there all right so we have scores, insert string from blue, red, print. Um, oh, sorry, we're doing blue 10 and here we're doing blue 25. So we're modifying blue, that's the difference here. Uh, so let's print it. And again, it is an option. So we're gonna use our special formatting here. And we're gonna print scores and let's just go ahead and call this function from our main function here clear that move out of your way here and let's run cargo run there you go blue 25 so we were able to modify it pretty cool so let's see now um, Okay, so that, that's oh, the 10 was overwritten by the 25. Only inserting a value if the key has no value. So I'm going to make a new function for that. Only insert value if key has no value. All right, and so here we're going to do let mute scores equal hash map new we're going to insert blue 10 that's our initial value initial value we're going to do scores dot entry string from red we're going to do red team and we're going to do dot or insert 50. And we're gonna do the same thing for blue or insert 50. And then we'll print scores. Okay, so let's see what this is doing uh, in a second. But I just wanna go over it before I read through it. So scores.entry, string from red, um, or insert 50. So if it's there, don't overwrite it. So give us that or insert 50. So let's run this and see what happens.
pull this up here. Clear that. Move out of your way. So red, blue, so there we go. So it inserted 50. It didn't insert 50 in blue because it already existed. That's pretty cool. So pretty neat. And generally in other languages, like in JavaScript, I know if I'm not trying to overwrite something, I'll check for its existence, right? I'll check if it's there first. If it is, I'll leave it alone. If it's not, then I'll insert and I'll use like the, the square brackets to check for a value. Um, so pretty cool. All right, that's awesome. So that's uh, only insert, and let's see what's going on here. Using the entry method to only insert if the key does not already have a value. The or insert method on entry is defined to return a mutable reference to the value for the corresponding entry key if that key exists. And if not, inserts the parameter as the new value for this key and returns a mutable reference to the new value. The, this technique is much cleaner than writing the logic ourselves and, in addition, plays more nicely with the borrow checker. R running the code in the listing 825 will print yellow 50, blue 10. The first call to entry will insert the key for the yellow team with the value 50 because the yellow team doesn't have a value already. The second call to entry will not change the hash map because the blue team already has a value of 10. So we're getting an entry using or insert, which is a function on entry. Updating a value based on the old value. So let's create another function for this. Update value based on old value. All right. So for this one, another common use case for hash maps scroll that up there, is to look up a key's value and then update it based on the old value, right? So if we're adding, we're summing or creating a count, right? For instance, list 826 shows code that counts how many times each word appears in some text. We use a hash map with the words as keys and increment the value to keep track of how many times they were found in the text. If it's the first time we've seen a word, we'll first insert the value of zero. That's weird, probably insert one. But all right, let's try it. So we have text. We're going to change hello, Twitch, wonderful Twitch. Uh, let mute map equal hash map new for word in text dot split split white space that's cool what does this say here hmm. I'm not sure what this is complaining about but we'll find out um, it might just be that this isn't compiling yet so let count equal map dot entry word dot or insert we're gonna insert one because it occurs once and then what we'll, we have the count so we'll say count plus equals one so for every word we check if it's there if it's not there we add one to show that there's one occurrence of it otherwise we're going to modify that and then here we'll do is print ln And we'll print and map. Pretty cool. All right, let's run it and see what happens. So first, let me go ahead and copy this, paste it up here so we can. And let's clear that, move you all over here, and let's try running it. So let's do cargo run. And there we can see, wonderful two, hello two, Twitch three. Um, that's why we started with zero, because um, it's always adding one. So that's where our logic messed up. No matter what, we're adding one. That's why it starts at zero. So let's do that. I see, I see what they're doing there. Clear that out, cargo run. There we go, wonderful one, Twitch two, hello one. So pretty cool.
All right, onward and upward. This code will print world two, hello one, wonderful one, or in our case, Twitch, you know. Uh, the or insert method actually returns a mutable reference uh, to the value of this key. Here we store that mutable reference in the count variable. So in order to assign to that value, we must first dereference count using the asterisk. The mutable reference goes out of scope at the end of the for loop. So all of these changes are safe and allowed by the borrowing rules. So really cool. Hashing functions. By default, HashMap uses a cryptographically strong hashing function that can provide resistance to denial of service or DOS attacks. This is not the fastest hashing algorithm available, but the trade-off for better security that comes with the drop in performance is worth it. If you profile your code to find that the default hash function is too slow for your purposes, you can switch to another function by specifying a different hasher. A hasher is a type that implements the build hasher trait. We'll talk about traits and how to implement them in chapter 10. Come on, you knew it, you knew it's coming. You don't necessarily have to implement your own hasher from scratch. Crates.io has libraries shared by other Rust users that provide hashers implementing many common hashing algorithms. Really cool. All right, we're just in time. We're just in time, wrapping up chapter eight, right on the dime. Chapter 10, chapter 10. Ah, ah. Chapter 10. We're going to get there. We're going to have a special anniversary episode for Chapter 10, I'm telling you. We're going to get a cake. Maybe some brownies. You know, we'll see. Summary. Vectors, strings, and hash maps will provide a large amount of functionality necessary in programs we need to store, access, and modify data. And these are what collections are for. Here are some exercises you should now be equipped to solve. Very good. We have some stuff for next week, some homework. Since it's close to 11, we're not going to hop into these today. Maybe we'll do one. We'll see. Um, let's look at what they are, though, because this will be great. Now we have some exercises. I like when they give us exercises at the end of the chapter. It like helps us you know, work through problems and actually build stuff out and, and figure it out on our own, and that's that's great. So... Given a list of integers, use a vector and return the mean, the average value. Median, uh, which is when sorted the value in the middle position. And mode, the value that occurs most often. A hash map will be helpful here. So in this case, in our text, our mode was Twitch, right? Uh, we, could, we could write this really quick, I'm sure. Um, convert strings to pig Latin. Uh, so this is a funny one. The first uh, consonant of each word is moved to the end of the word. And A is added, so first becomes erstfe. Words that start with a value have hey added to the end. Instead, apple becomes apple hey. Who's doing this? Who did this? Who did this? Who did this in school? You did this? You talk like this, chat? You were using this? Pfft. I was studying the blade while you were using Pig Latin in school. Add Sally to engineering or add Amir to sales. Oh, that's the next one. So, all right, it's Pig Latin, add hey, we can do that. We can do that, whatever. Uh, use a hash map and vectors. Create a text interface to allow a user to add employee names to a department in a company. For example, add Sally to engineering or add Amir to sales. Then let the user retrieve a list of all people in a department or people in the company by department sorted alphabetically. That could be cool. The standard library API documentation describes method that vector strings and hash maps have that will be helpful in these exercises. We'll definitely do that. We're getting into more complex programs in which operations can fail. It's time, it's per time to discuss error handling. We'll do that next. Yeah, that sounds great. What I'm gonna do, um, we're almost at 11. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just quickly create a folder for exercises for chapter eight. Um, and so I'm going to do exercises. Um, I'll just do cargo new exercises. Go in there. And now we have 
our exercises. And I'm going to go ahead and create some signatures. So we'll do uh, average. I'll do the type signatures for these in a second. Uh, we want a median. Again, that's the middle number when sorted. And mode, which is the one that occurs most often. And average is going to return a, I think because we're doing division, we're going to have to return an F64. Median is going to return a 32-bit integer signed. And mode is going to return a signed 32-bit integer. So it's going to take a vector of that type. So here, check it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a vector of type uh, numbers. So we have vector of type F64. Numbers, so we have vector of type 32. And this is going to take, well, mode is going to take a, is also going to take numbers. It's going to be a vector of type I32. And here we can just return zero to get these to compile really quick. All right. We are ready to go for next week. We are just at 11, so we'll wrap it up here. We'll save the exercises for early next stream. Awesome job going through this stuff. Really fun, chapter eight. Um, yeah, we'll do this early. It might be nice to, you know, we won't get through them all now, so it'll be good to have some stuff to do next, next time. Uh, we could probably, you know, handle one of these pretty easily, but We'll call it, we're at 11. We'll do these first thing next stream. Awesome job getting through chapter eight. We're two chapters away from the big chapter 10 that everyone's been waiting for. It better be a good one. Looks like it's gonna be pretty long. So again, we just finished chapter eight on common collections. We'll do the exercises for chapter eight next Tuesday, nine to 11 catch it on stream here. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'll push this code up again. The code is all going to go up on my GitHub, which we have here, github, github.com slash Tom girl. Again, we have our YouTube channel here where we're going to post the videos. This video will be posted in 1080p. It'll show up tomorrow morning. It'll show up in standard def. I'll show up in standard F tomorrow morning, wait for the 1080p uh, showing up later tomorrow afternoon after all my edits are done. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you. I appreciate it. If you want to hit that subscribe button, you'll get notified when new content comes out, usually every Wednesday. And if you're on Twitch, I uh, appreciate the follow. You'll get notified when we go live. Julian or Juliano Ramirez, welcome to the chat. You just missed the stream. We're about to end, but... I appreciate you stopping by and you can catch us next time or you can watch the, the video after Twitch is over. I don't know if any of you uh, know this, but if you're on Twitch, uh, basically all you need to do is you can go to videos and watch the past broadcast. You is you can go to videos so this and is watch me live. That's past weird. I don't want to watch that. Broadcast. You is but you can go to you can videos. Go to videos. Live look, look at this. Ah, ah. But you can go to So videos. all you would want to do is go over to channel. Ah, I'm getting a duplicate because I'm live so here. You do is go but you can watch past broadcasts right on the channel. And again, you can also check it out tomorrow once it gets posted to YouTube. All of the parts are here on YouTube, chapters one through seven. This is chapter eight. That'll be going up soon. You saw that. Yeah. Blah. Tried. Um, we also have some other videos in the series. We did a, a live coding of a serverless AWS Lambda backend API using DynamoDB for storage, uh, S3 for image storage. We use TypeScript for that. So check that out. That's using Node. Uh, that was awesome. And the series before that, where we built a React Native app using RecoilJS, Expo, and TypeScript. So check that out. The videos are there. Thanks again for joining us. We're becoming Rustations. We're we are growing our toolbox. We're getting more stuff. Tang said that could be handy for a project I heard about. Yes, it could. A lot of stuff we can do with that. So Tank's rolling in. He's got the ideas already. He's working. He's thinking about it. 
We're all becoming rest stations together. We're going to be able to do these exercises no problem next week. I'm pretty confident. So I look forward to it. Join me here next week again, Tuesday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Also, another update. I'm going to probably be adding some ad hoc days where we do some smaller stuff, either with Rust or with something else uh, to try to, you know, just stream a little bit more. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, it's been really great. So look forward to it. Thanks again. Really appreciate everyone stopping by. I hope you have an amazing rest of your night. And just keep learning, keep reading Rust. And we're going to start those exercises next week. Look forward to seeing you all there. Have a good night. Later. Whoop.